Hi, my name is Howard Jones and welcome to another of my online uh, painting tutorials. This one is of a croft, a Scottish farm uh, here in the UK. Um, I'm about to show you the list of materials that I've used in this tutorial, so if you want to pause the video at that point, um, it'll help you prepare. Um, I hope you enjoy this, I hope you have some success doing it. Um, if you give it a go, that is. And um, I welcome any comments that you might want to leave. So, uh, happy painting and good luck. So, let's just put those grid lines in and um, consider what, the, what we need the grid lines for and how useful they can be for us. So you can see here, I'm just using the ruler on this occasion to put those, um, put the grid lines in. It's basically two equispaced verticals followed by two equispaced horizontals. What this gives you, more, most importantly, is a few things. It, it's very helpful for a number of reasons. These are four intersections. These four intersections here are where you, where you can potentially place your focal point. As you can see, we've chosen the upper right section there uh, of this of this painting and that's the white croft of course the Scottish sort of farm like building. The other benefits to putting a, a, a grid in um, really is so that you don't oversize things you know with those vertical line there on the right hand side you can compare that I mean you can put these draw uh, these grids over your photos if you print them off or you can just simply envisage them like I tend to do and um, you can use that grid to place specific strategic um, details such as that chimney there you know it's very close you can see that it's very close to the uh, right vertical and that um, the measurement of that building just goes works its way in from right to left um, and uh, you can see the chimney doesn't quite reach the middle spot of that central square. So at least that way you're not going to end up making your building too long, too wide. Um, the left hand vertical will tell you what sort of resides in the scene around that area. So it's, it's a very useful um, uh, technique to apply the grid. So let's just erase those grid lines for a moment. And incidentally, I wouldn't normally, uh, I used to, I wouldn't, I was going to say, I would, wouldn't normally put those, those grid lines physically onto my paper. Um, but I certainly used to. Um, but you get so used to it after a while, you can envisage them. You can sort of see them in your head. So now we're going to um, get into the, um, the, the texture and how we break up the scene. Okay, what you'll notice, what I'm doing here is I'm making very bold and obvious vertical lines to tell me where that um, those winter trees are back there. Now, by complete comparison down here in the foreground, completely different shape that will outline the boulders in the grass here. And, and it's very important to make this, to be able to differentiate in a, in an easy fashion, a quick glance of the scene, and you suddenly realize that you're looking at boulders in the grass down here. Um, but it, it, it's surprising, it's all too easy sometimes just to sort of keep making the same marks. And although this is pencil work and a lot of it may be lost uh, under paint and different mediums by the end of the painting, um, what, the, what this is really for is to um, be there as a guideline, as a, as a road map, while we're actually painting the scene. Um, and, you know, you can go as bold as I am here with your pencil work if you wish. Um, particularly, I, I wouldn't do this if it was watercolour, but this is mixed media. And um, I would certainly consider going, you know, perhaps a little bolder with your pen, pencil work than you would normally. So... Um, so let's look again at the um, the different textures. 
Now as I turn my attention to the other areas, so we've done some good verticals to suggest those winter trees in the background, that sort of horizontal bank of verticals that, either, that are either side of the house, the building, but um, what about these walls that are sort of just beyond, folk, uh, beyond the um, foreground here? They're sort of upper foreground rather than middle ground. I, I sort of see the house as middle ground. So we've got to use a, a more open texture f for these um, smaller walls, these horizontals, just so that they look different from the foreground. You know, again, these foreground shapes are so obvious, so bold, but... Um, if we were to start putting small rock-like circular shapes in the walls, we wouldn't know where the vertical walls start and the foreground boulders stop. So what do we do? We have to use a sort of symbol. Our heads need to think in that sort of design fashion, showing one area off the other. Now I got rid of that background sky because it was just, it would be too much texture. There would be texture at the top, texture through the middle ground, texture in the foreground. Okay, when really we want some, we want certainly want texture. Uh, we want tonal values, We've got to think about it, our edges. Um, and then we need to um, think about how we create depth, of course. Um, and I'm putting a vertical line there to tell me that it is a it's a different shape. It's a vertical, you know. This this the, the, and and then I'm looking at the, um, the 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 texture of those areas must be more open. Foreground shapes are very tight. That's a, a, a you can almost refer to it as a closed texture. Um, it's very informative. It's obvious. But those horizontal walls, even though they're made up of the same objects, that is, boulders and stones and rocks, you must be able to indicate that they do something different. Now, there's the corrugated, this, there's these sort of three sheets of corrugated steel. Um, and what I liked about those initially, and I can talk retrospectively, re retrospectively rather, here, um, because of the um, luxury of being able to have painted this by this time. The painting had been finished. And I decided, I, re I got quite excited about the, the corrugated sheeting. They offered a strong, strong horizontal um, against the verticals that were behind it. But we lost them in the end. We chose, I chose to play them down um, for reasons explained a bit further on. So let's get the house in here. Is the end. I put a window in that end there because I f just felt as though it needed breaking up. So just put in the furthest chimney in place there. And that window, as I say, at the gable end just makes it a bit more interesting. Door on the porch or the lean-to, whatever this, this is referred to in these sort of old farm-type buildings. And in front here, if you look at the photo, there's um, what looks like, um, there's a row back there, looks like the storage of some sort. Maybe it's where they keep their uh, firewood. So I made some little, uh, just basically what I thought I saw in the photo. Um, a little bit more inference of verticals back there because there was a continuation of the, you know, the winter trees and bushes. I think you've got to remember all the time that um, you've got to, um, I don't know, suppose not play games with your with your viewer. Uh, you, I always try to imagine what the person would be thinking if this was on a wall in a gallery. Um, how is that going to impact upon a person? And I think, I think they say the same thing about songs and music. You know, that if that things will grab you within a couple of seconds. Usually, it will grab your attention in a couple of seconds, um, and then you need to pull your viewer in. And when you've pulled them in to look at closer at your painting. Um, you really need to um, uh, sometimes just isolate shapes, make sure that you're showing these shapes off for what they are and, and not being too ambiguous about it. You know, make it obvious. This is why I 
play off verticals with horizontals and sometimes diagonals. Those are the best tools at your disposal for doing that, of saying this area is this and the area next to it is this, it's different. And, um, and that's exactly why I'm putting these directional lines now on the roof. The little dormer roofs come in one direction and the main body of that house roof uh, comes down in another direction. Oh, it's all about directional lines to indicate different facets, different surfaces and angles in your uh, objects and, and subject matter. Or components that make up your painting. So if we put in a few more verticals in this nearer wall coupled with a cup uh, coupled with a few um stone faces rock faces we get a much better idea of what we're looking at the, you know if, if you don't do if you don't adopt this approach you'll have a mess you you basically have a very busy cacophony of different shapes that won't make any sense you just be far too busy I'm going even bolder around these um, shapes in the foreground now. But here, as I go back again, um, look at how how I'm chasing the line around these these rocks and boulders in the foreground. You know, there's there's absolutely no question then about what you're looking at. It's, you know, you're not, not playing games, just making it so bold. There is, of course, a different texture to these things also. Um, I, I wouldn't be going as bold with my pencil work in the line of uh, winter trees back there. It would be too heavy but in that foreground when you when you you can almost not um, overdo the bold uh, delineation in those foreground shapes and what I'm doing there is I'm just shading around the um, either side of my house of the croft um, I'm almost treating this underlying drawing a, a bit like a, a, a sketch in a way um, because my tension when we when we do get the paint going um, we have to nail the the focal point and um, by just going around either side of it thinking about how the darks complement the lights and vice versa keep your darkest darks next to your lightest lights only for the focal point territory. It's like it, it's the dark and the light working together to, to, to create that powerful impact in that particular area. So I think we're ready now. I'm just looking at the drawing and um, weighing it all up, making sure I'm happy with everything as it stands. And I think we're ready to get some paints uh, out and um, start having some fun. Please consider subscribing to my channel and if you would like immediate notification as to uh, when I upload my fresh videos then please also remember to just click on the bell icon. Hope you enjoy what you're about to see. I'm going to put out some fresh, must be fresh paint folks from the tube. Don't, don't go trying to use something like this that might be sat in your, in your palettes, you'll be there all day. Always fresh paint. If you want a lot of paint quickly and you're relying on dried out things like this, scrubbing away like mad, you'll never get there, okay? It just, by the time you've got enough paint, if you ever get enough paint from dried out paint like that, what you wanted to do when it should have been still damp from the previous wash, that's gone too dry. So you'll end up with horrible dry brush marks in your paints. So I'm putting out a bit of 
burnt sienna, a bit of ultramarine blue. And we'll just get, we'll just, this is like, um, imagine, you know, like a, a jogger or a runner would just sort of go outside, stretch the legs, stretch the arms, warm up a little bit. This will just settle us down a little bit. Let me just show you how much of this. I, I, don't, don't be faint hearted about this. Let's, let's pick up almost equal amounts of both colors for the moment, okay? No. Um, so what, what have I got there? It's a, if you look at it, if you really look at it close, it's something like a, a, a darkened down, a grayed down olive green. OK, because um, there's a there's a lot of yellow in, in um, burnt sienna. I'm just going to go in around the back here and I'm going to take my time putting this in. Now, remember, think this is watercolor. It will dry out a lot lighter. It's, in fact, look how quickly it's lightening off there. So you've got to compensate for that. You've got to over, overdo it in a way. I'm, I'm coming down to these, this, about this area here, just above where we, we know there are um, some bushes dried out, winter bushes and things. I'm just cutting around my building a little more carefully. And look at that, I'm pushing the brush back and forth, almost like a sweeping brush over the floor here, okay? This is why, again, we need cheaper brushes and not expensive precious brushes. So I'm creating what I hope to be uh, a sort of interesting edge to this, this area. Come down into this, come down a little bit now. Um, now I'm gonna change this, it's very flat, isn't it? It's almost as though I've, I've, I've got the paints way too um, too thoroughly mixed and integrated. So it's become one color. So I'm just picking up a bit of the blue this time. Look at that, right at the edge of this big puddle on the palette. And with that, I will perhaps just go back up into here. Now the more variegated and um, that looks at the back there, the better really. I mean, within reason, don't, don't spend the next half an hour playing up here. Um, you just want to make sure that there are some differences back here, a little bit of warmth closer to the house. Perhaps this blue should live a bit further up the top of this area here. And I, what I said earlier about this is a, a way of settling yourself, of getting yourself just comfortable um, uh, getting something going. Now I've just popped my fingertips into my water tub there and I'll just flick a little bit of water into that. And I'm not going to try and suggest that, you know, these are the sheep on the background. They can be whatever your imagination wants them to be, but it, it just uh, offers a little bit of subtle um, information back there. The hint of something, whether those are gorse bushes or sheep or whatever, or boulders sticking out the ground, it's enough. But this almost flat background acts as a sort of counterfoil to, to, to the busyness that's going to come. Now then, um, I think it's really important while we've got this mix on the go here to consider Remember, we've got some very pale shapes in the form of those corrugated sheets here. So I'm going to make sure I don't go over those. But with this very same mix, a bit weaker, perhaps. Um, I'm just going to suggest these, this wall, sorry, and it comes in again here. Leave, leave some pockets of white paper, too. Just leave some pockets of, of white paper light like here. You know, maybe there's a part of that wall that's catching the light. T the tonal value, um, it's not the darkest of darks. It's not the lightest of lights. It's somewhere in, in the middle. Now, one, two, three sheets of um, that sheeting, that steel sheeting. So we'll leave those out because we can have a bit of fun with those, perhaps work a bit of um, line into them a bit later and certainly give them a, a different color. They are, they are this lovely pale gray blue. So I wouldn't mind if, if we can to try and sort of keep that. Now notice that all my brush strokes are horizontal because that's what we're looking at. The, the, the overall, the essence of that wall is a horizontal shape. Whereas what's behind is a vertical shape. So that can be dealt with on, as a separate issue, okay? 
Um, now, um, I think there's enough on there. So we've all, all again, all we're doing really is nailing the uh, the big shapes. We're not really fussing with any information, uh, any detail type information at all. Okay. Um, what I'm what I am going to do here, almost this is almost water now in the brush. Okay, I've just dunked my brush into into the water. See how weak that is. That's just water. Let's just take a little bit of weak blue ultramarine blue again um, and in some of these areas that will be our boulders just randomly place some of that um, that there are some very almost white looking um, shapes um, in those boulders and things but they won't be white don't 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 be tempted to paint them white we very very rarely use pure white in our paintings so I did that with the blue, didn't I? Very weak gray like blue. Why don't we do something similar now with a very weak burnt sienna? A uh, little bit less this time, a little bit less than, than the blue that we use. So only a smaller amount of the burnt sienna. And, and what we're doing is we're just setting everything up for, um, for more information that will come along further. I'm stopping and I'm looking and I'm sort of working out my next move. Um, so I think I think this is okay. And I'm what's going through my head at the moment is this. I, I've still got a wall there, haven't I? A nearer wall, and I haven't put anything on into. Um, and I think maybe we could just infer a few more. Uh, boulders in that wall because it is closer to us than that that wall there so let me just grab my paints and um I'm just going to take a very small amount of the thalo green I know I was just talking about the wall, but I just want to get something in the big areas here for a moment. So that tiny bit of phthalo green here. Now, if I use, if I'm very careful with it, it's a very bright green and take a little bit of burnt sienna with it. Okay. I'll get, believe it or not, a slightly yellow. Notice there wasn't a yellow on the, um, on the uh, color list. Okay. Because I wanted to show you how we can create um, more natural looking yellows by not using things like cadmium yellow, lemon yellows, we can avoid those. To put a, something bright, to put a bright yellow into this painting just wouldn't work with the other colors, okay? So there's my, and after all, it, it, it's a green really that we're looking for. There's, there's not much evidence of yellow in the painting. So I'm scrubbing in an area Remember this shape, this sort of triangle over here. There's this sort of distorted rectangle here, all on a bit of a, there's, there's a there is a hint of a diagonal, isn't there here? So we come up to that line there. Remember this here, that band there, okay, is a vertical wall. So you see that I've painted, and you, can't, you, you could certainly go into that wall with the green, no problem at all, a little bit. Okay, um, even even in around some of those those boulders there. But I'm what I'm trying to keep us um, concentrating on is the simplicity of the bigger shapes. If we if we do start pushing, you know, all the colours into all the areas, we will lose that sense of um, of the big shapes, and you can't you you, you don't. Um, is there a hint? Certainly is a hint uh, of, of greens in places. So just some vertical brush work. So I went over my building then. Some vertical brush work in here. Just a little bit. And at this stage, it's always, I, re, I always refer to this stage as the ugly stage. You know, it should look random. It shouldn't look clever. It shouldn't look sophisticated. 
Um, and I think we, it's important that we appreciate that and accept it because, you know, if there's one thing that makes us uh, overwork a painting and, and spoil a painting, I think, I think that's not having the patience of putting up with your painting at this ugly stage. Um, we want to be, uh, we want to be seeing the finishing line from the first brush stroke, you know, and that's a big mistake. Um, the underlying ugliness is a fantastic counterpoint for what goes on top. But I really mustn't forget about this, this wall here. Let's, let's remind ourselves and just say, well, let's pencil in a few smaller, more horizontal brick-like shapes in this wall. So let's pick up that number six round brush, um, dunking it in the water. And I'm going to take some, I'm still working with watercolor paint for the moment. I can see what I mean now about um, dry paints making it really difficult to work. That would be okay if I just wanted to obliterate and use the whole amount, but it, it skins over, you see, and you can't pick it up. I can break into that one there. There's just about enough, but that one's gone way too dry. What I do a lot these days, actually, I'll show you now. Um, I tend to work when I'm doing this dry brush technique with the small, small pointed brush, I tend to use a, a pickle jar lid. Um, and that way I can keep the uh, fresh paint dry um, because when it's in the, if you're using a, a palette, the likelihood is every time you pick up, when you're doing the initial stages, every time you pick up paint, you flood that little well and that paint with water. So to be able to do what I want to do now, you wouldn't be able to, there's just simply too much water in there. So I tend to just uh, squeeze out a small amount of the two colors, in this case, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, and use that as my mini, mini palette. It ensures an absolutely dry brush mix. So, so dry in fact, that it won't initially want to come off the brush. So you, what you do is then you find the smallest amount of uh, water from somewhere, and I mean a really small amount. No, we're okay, I think. Uh, so that then becomes my dry brush uh, mix. Let's put that out the way. And where am I going with this? Well, for the moment, I, th I think it, I think we should establish the windows in the building for now. So a single hit for each of those marks. Just copying my pencil work, really. Uh, there's a window here, there's a door on the front end of that building there. As I say, if you can, try to make these single hits, okay? Just a, a lintel on top of that roof there, that one there. Maybe something across the, um, let, me just home, let me just move you right in close. You can see exactly what I'm doing here. We'll go out of focus for a moment. Okay, this is what I'm doing. Hang on, just pick up, you've got to keep on picking up this little miniature mix all the time, reloading it. Uh, so I'm, there's, a win, there's a doorway just above that, that wall there. I'm just putting a single nick in there, okay? It's no more than a, like a sort of lozenge shape. This is a line at the edge of my building up there. A little bit of up blue, a little bit of burnt sienna. Um, and in this, area here let's let's have some fun in the uh, area of the con um, corrugated sheeting i'm going to put some posts that separate those corrugated sheets just a little vertical here and as I say, it's a very hit and miss delivery of paint can you see that you know it's um hence the name you know dry dry brush that's exactly what it is there's so little water in there that the brush sorry the paint doesn't actually want to come off the brush so there's a post here, a post there. Gets to a point where you've got to find a tiny bit of moisture from somewhere just to get the paint off the brush. Uh, and then there's this end here. So there are my posts. I'm going to run a couple of horizontal lines to show the corrugated effect through, through those sheets. Just a few, not, not all the way down or all the way along. Just, just a few broken lines like this. It is important that if we got this vertical directly behind it, that this stuff appears horizontal by, by 
juxtaposition just to show both both off as different areas. Now there's a top of a wall about here. So I'll just run along there with this. Remember, we still got this wall in front of us. And I think I'm going to sort of delineate that a little better. Tiny bit of water from somewhere. Both my burnt sienna and my ultramarine blue colors. Put a bit more burnt sienna in, the, in my little miniature palette here. This is quite a nice bit because you, you can actually take your time on this. It's a, it's quite a relaxing thing to do. I would say top of this wall about here somewhere. There's a little bit more water now in this mix because I need slightly to make slightly longer lines. So a little bit more water will help me to do that. Again, across here, something like this, break it up. Remember this wall has a, a bottom uh, line to it where it meets the grass. That's about here somewhere. Pops up in various places. And perhaps we can uh, just go around the lower edges of some of these boulders now with the same mix. Now, a lot of this mix will um, dissolve later because we'll be putting further washes down and some of this that i'm doing now will actually disappear you won't see it well it, it'll disappear uh, it'll it, it'll partially disappear it, it'll be underlying which gives your painting a nice bit of depth um i'll try and point it out at the end of the painting you know i'll sort of say well do you remember when we when we put some line around here um you, you it, it's not obvious anymore at the end of the painting, but there's something there that tells you there's some depth there. So I'm not going over the tops of these boulders and, and rocks. I'm tending to go to the around the base of them, as you'd expect to find that to be a, a more shadowy sort of area. And they and it, it's an opportunity if you can see this. When I run a line like this around the base of these stones and, and rocks, there's an opportunity to join, to join one rock to the other with a simple line like this, you know, over to that one, maybe up to that one, across to that one. As I say, it's it's like drawing again. It's it's like having the pencil back in your hand, only this time with a with a, a brush and paint. Uh, now then, I'm going to show you a slightly different technique for what I'm about to do next. I was talking earlier about the wall, the, the furthest walls, this one here and the one slightly above. Same mix, okay, I haven't changed the colours, the paint colours at all, but what I am going to do is um, take the palette back here, dunk this brush into my water just lightly and roll that brush around on its side on the belly like this, okay? A uh, bit more water. And this will allow me to, I want a bit more blue in this mix. Uh, this will allow me now to further texture some of these areas back here. There's a funny area back here, just behind the corrugated sheet. And I think I'm gonna have to put something in there for tonal value and then think about the color that I might want in there later. So I just put some broken delivery there, run a finger into there a little bit. Um, and so back into the wall with a lot of water. So as you can see, I'm choosing areas just to add a little bit more texture here. So I'm not obliterating the entire wall. I'm just making sure that it looks broken through here. I think we ought to get some blue into the corrugated sheeting. I think that will sort of lift things. It's time to give ourselves a little bit of a boost. Um, so let's let's have some pretty just through the, the corrugated sheeting. Um, so take a little bit of clean ultramarine blue from my little mini palette. Quite a bit of Quite a bit of water in that. Uh, just run some paint. Just, just deliver the paint for a moment, okay? Just like that. Just three strokes for one for each um, corrugated panel, 
and then my brush is uh, dunked in the water over here. And I'll just skim, just be a bit creative and just skim the belly of the brush with water into those corrugated sheets. And the aim is not to obliterate the entire corrugated sheet, but just more like we did with the wall, just deliver a broken, um, a broken uh, a, a wash, mini wash, if you like. So I think we need to go possibly to the top, more to the top of those corrugated sheets. It's, a, it's quite an abstract sort of shape over here. There's a little bit in the wall there, I quite fancy that, or something, something in that right-hand side. It could be a rusty old, bit of rusty old fence. But yeah, that again, you see, just as the blue in the corrugated sheet lifted the area, this lifts it even further by a bit of clean saturated color. I haven't um, contaminated that color too much with anything else. Okay. Um, now then, when I look at these wonderful winter bushes that come down here, and, and it's offering a gentle, there's a slight diagonal in this design, in this movement. I see um, a, a bit of a boring-ish color for, for a lot of that. So I think um, we've got alizarin crimson on our color list. Um, so I think we're gonna have a bit of fun with burnt sienna and a little bit of alizarin crimson. We'll see how that sits in the balance of things. Um, so we wanna get onto using some acrylic inks in a moment. So I'll show you what I'm doing here. Bit of burnt sienna, bit of this alizarin crimson that I've just placed, and I mean a small amount. And if I describe that color, it's a sort of lovely peach color. And I'm gonna go with the direction of the object, which is vertical, if you remember from the pencil marks. And I'm just gonna pull the belly of the brush vertically down. Don't really wanna go behind with that. I'm just gonna choose that area there and pull this, this beautiful color down through here. It's amazing how a bit of saturated color starts to lift the whole scene. Now we may go too far. You, you can sort of go too bright. Um, that's really your choice. It's how it's, it, I liken it to sort of choosing how much sugar or no sugar or whatever it is you, we put with our food or our teas and our coffees. It's, it's like that. We all, we will all have slightly different, um, ideas as to what um, what we prefer. So, but what I'm doing more to the point here is sometimes um, I'm just picking up one of those two colors. And in this case, as I speak, I've just picked up the alizarin crimson. So again, it's a broken color. It may overall look like a peachy color, but that's a distance thing. That, that's, that's because of the viewing distance. It looks like an overall sort of color but slightly closer and you'll see the separate, separate colors. And the, the, uh, of the two, the alizarin crimson is the cooler of the two colors. And given that this area back here is a bit further away from us, I think it'd be, it's only right that the alizarin crimson is used more back there, okay? And that the um, burnt sienna is brought in as I'm doing now more here. That really works well for suggesting depth. Color temperature is a, is a powerful um, tool for, for, uh, for, for creating depth. Yeah, it's referred to, or used to be referred to a lot in some of the older books as aerial perspective, you know, as opposed to linear perspective, of course, geometrical perspective. Um, color temperature was, was referred to as aerial perspective. So it just simply means now that perhaps that's not as special as it was because it's not now the only bit of saturated color in the painting. But, you know, early days, um, we, can, we can adjust, still adjust things accordingly. So just making sure I like that shape there now. Quite a bit quite a bit stronger maybe at the top of that shape. Uh, and a little bit, a little bit darker there. Okay, I think we should, um, oh, before we do, 
so we should move on to using some of these other materials. Um, before we do, and if I can find that card I had, to further the effects of this um, area as a different area to the others, why don't we run some vertical scrapes through in places, okay? Make block shapes if you want. The edges will always suggest that it's vertical because wherever that card stops will leave you with a, with a vertical line, okay? And I think we will go over those again anyway towards the, um, towards the end. So can we leave the building to the very last or not? Uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, putting, putting color on. Well, I think we can for the walls. Um, but I think maybe we should consider something for the roofs. So at this stage, now nothing, nothing in the rule books sort of say that's when this is the time to do the roof of the building. Uh, again, it, it's, I, it's, I find it difficult to explain why I've left it till now, if I'm perfectly honest. And I think it's because I have a, a rule of them and that is to stay out of the focal point territory for as long as possible, okay? Um, but now that it's coming uh, everywhere else is taking form, I think there comes a point where you the, the needle on the meter sort of goes, hang on, you know, it's it will look more in balance now if you do something about the roof. So that's what I'm going to do. And this is a mix again of ultramarine blue, uh, burnt sienna. Um, and it's a flattish application I'm using at the moment. Don't go into the chimneys, leave them pale for the moment. Now we know that the, um, the other little roofs on these uh, dormers or whatever they are up here are the same color, but you know, it's really important to change the tone of them because they're at a different angle to the main part of the roof. So if you add a little bit more water to those, okay, that'll look, it will look better. You'll be able to differentiate between this angle here to the one that's coming down the main part of the roof. It's catching more light. Okay, so it'd be like that. Uh, right, now I should have, and I'll just do it very quickly. I should have given us a slightly stronger uh, dry brush line underneath these, um, underneath the, the eaves here. There. Okay. And I just, again, this is just sort of simple embellishment. It's not, I've got to take that roof just a bit further this way. That's better. And I think we're, I think for as far as the building goes, at least, we're probably on track again. So let's, um, Let's have a look at uh, some other materials. I think it is time to put some crayon, oil crayon on. Now, again, if you're using uh, water soluble crayons, uh, dry pastel, um, try, try, try putting them in as I'm doing now at this stage, okay? I'm still looking, sorry, I'm still looking, I'm still spotting areas I, I should, really should have done with, with the dry brush here, just delineating the edges of our roofs in places on the building. There's a chimney pot on top of those two. Okay, I'm fiddling, stop fiddling. Uh, yeah, let's get the oil crayon going. So... We have, it's no, no sort of, it wasn't a random idea to choose these colors. If, if you've already probably spotted, basically these are the primary colors, all be the red or pink. Um, they are the primary colors, blue, red, or pink, and yellow, okay? So uh, I want some abstract thinking going on here, folks. So take, just run. And it will act as a resist, remember. Nothing's going to change this color once it's on. So be, be bear that in mind. Be a little bit careful um, once this is on. It, if, you're work, if, you're, if you are using water-soluble versions, 
um, then expect this stuff to move around when we put further washes. And that's no, that could be great. You know, you could end up with the best painting of all of us at the end of the day. But um, that's that's the point I make about about um, mixed media. There there are no real set rules. It's all about in, in invention and creativity. And uh, you know the serendipity, you. You, you, you just might get that bit of magic. So I'm just mainly concentrating around the foreground, if I'm honest. I don't want to put too much resist beyond the foreground because, um, well, it, it, tr trust me, it won't look correct back there. Just a little bit maybe around the house. It's a very random... Uh, uh, intuitive thing this now, i'd like something in these i'd like to create some verticals down here where we said these you know we need a bit of vertical down here because the vertical is further back in the scene so a little bit of vertical in places so that's my red let's turn our attention to a little bit of yellow i won't use as much as this just a little bit here and there we can imagine that this is like the lichens and mosses that grow on these ancient old boulders and uh, and rocks and things. And then, right, the blue. Why don't we try it in the, uh, just a couple of strokes of that blue in the corrugated sheet there, just one or two. It's not a full measurement from one end of this shape to the other. It's, it's a partial horizontal, uh, I was gonna call it a brush stroke then, but it's, it's, it's the same sort of principle. It's a brush stroke effectively. Okay, and then we might be able to tie this blue in if it were to travel down bottom of the wall here into the foreground a little bit. And this helps, um, this helps, you know, I, I haven't used this term for a long time, but the threading, the knitting together of one shape to the other. If you can choose a line or a color and a line and say, well, you know, this is almost like a little road. It's like looking down on an aerial map. And this little color here chases its way down through the landscape onto the top of the wall there, down in through the wall here, onto the boulders. It's a great way of, of making sure that your um, painting is, is knitting and pulling together. So I'm coming this direction. This is the blue oil crayon. You could do with this, you'd be doing this with ink. Um, even a pen, you know, I know I didn't put a pen on the list, but for another um, for another day, we'll perhaps do, you know, the next mixed media, we'll have a different array of, of um, materials. So I think I'm okay with this. I've created that little bit of threading, comes in from the right to the left, comes in from the left to the right, maybe. A little bit through the background. But as I say, you don't want to put too much of this texture too far back. It's mainly the lion's share of this stuff is really for the foreground. Okay, let's put those aside for a moment. And let's uh, do a little bit. Let's think now on um, inks. Let's have a look at those inks. I'm going to clean my palette off here. So. Not that it would matter, you know, I, I could leave this little bit of paint, paint on that palette uh, while I use the inks, but I, I just want to, certainly for you folks to see just uh, the, the, the huge difference, the intensity of ink compared to other mediums. And if I leave that watercolor on there to contaminate that, you're not going to get the benefit of that. Um, I give it a good shake because it has a habit of settling, a sediment set it, settling at the bottom there. So good old shake. And um, I put a small amount out on my palette. I mean a small amount. This stuff is incredibly intense. Okay. Um, and I'm going to just pre-wet an area around here, around these areas. Now, this is what I mean about um, going over your... Uh, oil 
pastels with a with a good quality brush. This isn't a particularly expensive brush. What I'm going to do, I'm, I'm mostly sort of tapping the water on. And in any way, I think that makes for a far more interesting delivery of ink rather than brush it around. So I'll tap this water into this area. And now I'm going to pick up the ink, OK? Make sure everything's in shock because I've, I've, I've zoomed in, of course. So there's me picking up the ink. I'm going to do the same with the ink. Look at that. Just just tap it onto those areas and, and take a second to see what it's doing before you just rant. You know, don't just sort of methodically keep tapping stuff into the area. Stop every now and again. And see how much effect it's having. Need a little bit more over here for a moment. We can always put more on later. But I think that the, the, the warning, the, the, the tip here is to say, do a bit, stop. You can always do it again rather than overload it too too early. I'm going to do the same with the black ink here. Give it a shake. So once again, take a little bit of, it doesn't matter if it integrates, which it's going to do with my first color. Just put out a small amount here. Um, that goes on top like this. Okay. And I'm going to go into this wall. I paint around, carefully paint around any boulder avoid losing the boulders shapes in front sorry now if we're not careful by creating such a strong horizontal here there's no way through to the house so i'm going to play the strength of this down just about here and it'll be like sort of saying yep yeah, if you want to get to the house this is where you go this even, even though there's a, a mark there on top of the wall okay we can sort of say look there's a way through this this strong horizontal to get uh, further into the painting. But I mean, this is, this is good. I mean, this is just a spontaneous idea. Um, and there it is. I'll have to probably zoom out again in a moment. Um, but at the moment, I think you're probably getting a pretty good view of, of what's happening down here. So, Bit, there's a bit of spattering remember. Remember what I said about these areas here in the foreground? They're, they're peaceful, restful areas. So if they did get a bit busy from spattering and things like that, just run as I'm doing here uh, and um, declutter. A little bit of that spatter down there doesn't do any harm at all. I certainly intend to bring out the spatter some white gouache towards the end of the, of the painting anyway. OK. Um, now that, that what's occurring to me now is I'm thinking, wow, it's all it is busy. It, it, there's a you know there's such a busy area here. Um, got a couple of straggler shapes down here, shapes that have uh, managed I've managed to sort of overlook. So I'm going to borrow a little bit of paint that's still sitting on the surface and paint a couple of those extra bricks and shapes in. A little bit of shape to that one there. A little bit of shape into here. So I'm re-establishing more uh, it, it, shapes that are easier to recognize. So you're, the purpose of that early drawing is, is to keep things in focus, because if you don't put in a good, strong design in the early stages, you, you're having to guess at this sort of thing that I'm doing now. You just sort of you're making rather more random uh, shapes, but I'm able to see the shapes that I put in with the, um, the pencil earlier. Okay, I think we need to do some line, uh, to get some line work going again, okay, just to uh, separate things. So this is what I'm going to do. This is what I do a lot. Um, I've got all this ink, remember, still on the surface of the paper. I'm going to run the edge of that credit card in, into that ink. So effectively, I, I've got a little line on the edge of that card. Um, and, I, I, and I'm just going to put some good, strong, picking up all the time, good, strong lines in places. Um, some over the top of that. Often this is no more than a push and a touch and a... Maybe even some through here like this. 
let's move that apparently so i'm scraping move it about sorry so i'm scraping have sort of lost that but i think i i think it's worth forfeiting one of these little restful areas down here uh, i'll come up here and do the same just holding the the card on the surface try and get my hand out the way show you what i'm doing i've loaded the edge of this card okay and i make contact with the paper and i'll just turn it like this it's great it's great it really it, it's surprising how natural that that can look um and uh again maybe over here perhaps we ought to go a little bit darker on this wall here Now it's taking shape. Now I can see the foreground, and now the midground and distance is being pushed further back again. So, but is that ink is a one thing you've got to watch out with ink is um, it's so intense it will flatten things. It's okay if you need an area of flatness, and sometimes we do. But I think we should just pull scrape out before this dries off. Scrape out a little inference here and there to put a couple of these stones that are in the wall are picking up a bit of uh, light that's that's bouncing around the place there just to take the flatness out okay maybe there's a maybe there's a little vertical again in front of that i'm, I'm really pressing so hard i'm almost trying, trying to damage the paper um just as though there's a couple of sticks um an old the remains of an old fence just popping up in front of that there Okay, um, now then, the vertical is up here along that line. Um, I've cut my card and you can still do it any time. In fact, I might cut it down a little bit smaller because if you look at that edge, it's possibly too big a measurement in some places. So I'm going to... So I cut them to shape as I need them. And with this again, I'm just going to reinstate some of those. So I'm picking up, let me show you again. I'm just picking up ink on the edge of that card and I'm manipulating some verticals back here and dragging them sideways now and again. I think what we ought to do now, I've got to, as I'm doing this, other ideas are entering my head. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is this. Look, if we look at how light, relatively speaking, this horizontal is here, I think we can go a lot darker here. It's either we go darker here or we go darker immediately behind the house again. But I think if we were to go dark behind, there would be an awkwardness in terms of, you know, dark colours tend to sort of pull things forward. Um, and if we do that too much in the background, just put a little bit of warmth in there a second. If we do that in the background, there'll be this weird, really strange, uncomfortable uh, effect of things in the background teetering towards us. So I'm going to plumb for a bit more of the ink. Let's just deliver it for a moment, okay? Deliver it any fashion you like. A horizontal delivery, but straight in, st I mean straight in, this is ink, with vertical brush work, brush marks okay and uh, you'll in a moment you'll see me pick up the credit card again and we'll get some of those verticals back in there when i get to these i put a lot more water in it's much weaker back there much paler okay now let's get the card again on here so don't don't get too now this is really a potential area where we we enjoy making some marks with a card and we before we know it we've made way too many much too much texture let's let's if you have to if you really have to count the amount of marks and and uh, effect you have on this here's here's one idea here it's scrape there it's one mark okay Here's my second mark. Let's take it across the top on over here somewhere. Drag it down before we finish. 
and then we stop and say, how's that looking? Yeah, I think that might be a bit heavy. So we'll scrape through there again and maybe leave it like that, okay? Why don't we um, take one tree out of here, let's edge of the card, and let's take out a, a winter tree just popping up like this. This is this is an I this is good. I like I, I like this idea that suddenly occurred. Okay. Um, because it might mean we want a smaller version back here. Breaks up that the all important vertical in in a powerful horizontal. When everything's looking horizontal, you so need something vertical. And the same can be said, you know, vice versa. If, you're, uh, if your painting and your design is predominantly horizontal, uh, sorry, pre predominantly vertical, you will need to put some um, contrast by uh, horizontal into your painting. Right, okay. I'm really enjoying this bit here. It's working well. And, you know, that would never have worked well if we'd have busied up the background as, you know, and suggested there was sky up there, there was um, there was a hillside, which there is, of course, we can see it in the photo. But if we were to have done that, no way would this what we're doing now looked so effective, so good. Right. OK, we're very nearly um, getting towards the finished uh, article here, folks. Um, let me just, oh yeah, a little, little practical tip. Make sure you put your um, inks somewhere out of the way and safe with their tops back on. I have uh, have some painful memories of times when I'd forgotten to do that. Just gonna pick up a rigger brush for a moment and sticking with the um, ink again, I think we should, so this is a, a rigger brush and I press it with my fingertips like this, okay? Press it flat, if you can see, sorry, I'll hold it down here, see it better. I press it flat and you can see it's splayed. So that'll allow me to put a, a smaller version of what's going on at the background there. Okay, uh, through here again, a little bit of that through through the corrugated sheet. Now, my only area, before I finish this painting, my only area of concern is still this sort of wall here. It's the right shape, it's a good horizontal, but I think we've got to suggest that it is more, uh, we've got to make more of a suggestion that it is a wall. Um, and not a flat bit of grass. Now, uh, forgive me a moment. I'm just taking off something that I know I'm going to put my hand in if I'm not careful. It's just a little collection of of uh, ink. So I think I'm thinking this. Let's just create a couple. I'll, I'll I'll take this is where we can mix literally mix the mediums here. There's a bit of watercolor. Pull that bit of ink into it. Okay make a sort of grayed down version of the burnt sienna. And, and, and let's have some, I'll be a little bit careful. This is, this is something I, 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 I you've got to be so careful. It, this is a random, um, it's just a random couple of shapes, uh, a random couple of, um, faces of stones in the wall to make it look like what it's supposed to look like. That's, that's actually, that, that's come out okay. And, I, and I, I never, you know, I never stop. If the idea enters my head, uh, I, I always just do it. I, I never question um, that, that idea. I think that's fatal. I think that's when things start falling apart and uh, we start losing the, the momentum that we need, that essential momentum that we need to uh, keep the confidence level up through the process. All right. Um, 
not sure about these now. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, that was one of the main, that was really, to me, that really caught my eye, the, the steel sheets. But I think we need to play them down a little bit before we get to the final work on the house, which is just going to be a, a simple shadow effect over there. So what do they need? Um, do we need to do it now? Can we leave it towards the end of the painting? Um, I think I need to see the tonal. I think maybe what it is, it's three, three things too much the same, isn't it? So why don't I say this one isn't, as, isn't getting as much light as the other two? So we'll, we'll do something like this. Maybe part of that second one also a little bit um i think that already that's a little bit better the one i chose to uh diminish in in terms of uh attention is the one furthest away from the focal point okay as we move towards the focal point things re remain quite noticeable okay again that's just a that's one of those compositional design sort of things going on um, you, you've got to remember that how just how important the focal point is and how we sort of protect it through the process until we get to near the end of the painting. Um, right, okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I think this will help. Um, the, the, um, the mount, uh, I'm going to get that out uh, because I tell you why, if you can, if with everything else going on around you when you're working is a distraction, you just isolate this for a moment with the mount. And um, it's amazing how that pops out answers that you can't see when all this is going on. Right, and I'll zoom out. I'll just zoom out and refocus. Oops. That's better. So what the mount allows me to do is to see it in, in perspective, literally, you know, sort of, um, in balance, sorry. Um, yeah, not in perspective. So I'm trying to envisage what it'll look like when I've done the final work, which is shadow out, is decide that, you know, the light in this painting, the light source, light direction, when I, when I took this photo those years ago, the light was behind me. So it illuminated everything, okay? It illuminated everything this side of me. But that's, that doesn't make for a particularly interesting, it doesn't show the light off, actually, uh, strangely enough. So I'm envisaging um, perhaps uh, a little bit of shadow, maybe the, the, the maybe, if we'd stayed here for another half an hour to an hour, some would have moved over here and there would have been some shadow falling on this building from the left-hand side. That would make for a much more interesting design, okay? Take the flatness out of this, out of this um, house. Can you see how at the moment, if we left the house like this, it almost looks like the house is an afterthought. It was cut out with a pair of scissors and stuck on the rest of the painting. But a shadow will bring depth and form and three dimension to a, a, an otherwise flat looking shape. So let's, let's do that. So let me just get rid of the ink here. And I'll probably need to put out a bit of fresh uh, ultramarine blue. Make sure the one inch flat brush, which is what I'm going to use to apply the, um, the shadow, is clean. I'm just rinsing that out. And here we go. Let's put in ultramarine blue, not too much, but I'm using um, a garden pea size, I suppose, uh, amount of paint. And I'll start by taking that into the main area of the mixing well, all of it. Make sure it's broken down. There's no sticky pigment in there. Now I'll take a small amount of the burnt, uh, sorry, the alizarin crimson. So we end up with a purple here, okay? But that of course would, I think anyway, would be too bright for, that's too artificial for this particular shadow color. So what I do is I take a little bit of 
burnt sienna here. And that will just gray that purple down a little bit, as you can see there, okay. Right, with that all ready to go, um, wherever I decide to put this shadow, um, light, uh, reminding ourselves, light's coming from here from the left. Uh, if I don't like what I've got, I just, with this tissue in my other hand, I would just lift it straight back out, okay? So let's get the practical brain on board and say, well, if light's coming from the left, anything vertical is bound to be throwing, casting a shadow over this, um, over the house. But I'm, I'm gonna play real safe. Um, and one thing I certainly could do bef before I apply the big brush, is take a small amount of that, um, oops, wrong brush. Uh, take a small amount of that shadow that I just mixed and go on the this side of the um, the roof lines, etc. And this this is going to be mostly in shadow. The gable end shadowed here. That would be shadow, wouldn't it? That would be shadow down here, through here. It'll hit a warmth in the shadow with a, just very quickly picked up a bit of burnt sienna. I know this is quite a speedy sort of uh, way of painting, but as I say. Um, you know, what are the essential skills uh, to painting um, loose style is, uh, is to get yourself uh, practiced and rehearsed in how to quickly uh, pick up different colors and different strengths of paint. So here we go. Let's say the shadow is mostly over here, over here, definitely shadow into there. There'd be a shadow off this building, something like that. Put a bit more in there. Um, I'm going to leave those the roof mostly uh, as it is, but a little bit of shadow from that uh, little uh, dormer. So we would expect there to be shadow behind the house into those areas. Like this shadows across from the tree onto this area here. I don't really want to shadow that nice red. So it will say that the, um, whatever it is, you know, casting the shadow up here is not casting a shadow onto it. That could be a cloud. It could be a, a woodland out of sight over here. So we have options all the time um, in, in terms of design. I think we would, I think we should shadow out more of this area here. So we'll shadow this, this wall. And this is what I meant about these now. Great idea initially, but I'm questioning that part of the design all the time. Um, I think we should mostly shadow that area there through here. And we'll leave just that panel there. That look actually, for whatever reason, that looks more like the photograph anyway. So, and then in the foreground, um, we'll shadow out parts of this. Now, when you shadow out the next wall, the next horizontal, you must go around the boulders that are in front of it, okay? And if you can, leave a little uh, a line of light on the top of that wall. So the, think about the bottom edge of the brush mark you're making and the top edge. So again, look, at. I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to go into this section of the wall because I think this light movement through here takes us in. And then finally with, the, with this um, shadow mix, I think we can shadow that out. Somehow the shadow has to get down to the foreground by, by hook or by crook. So I'm going to bring it through here. And then a quick swipe across there. This can be a lot softer, remember, because this is a soft area, but the, the color should be there. So I just dunk my brush very quickly in my water and I'm going to soften that shadow edge. There's the vertical there of the, uh, from the um, grasses, the dead grasses. Now I'm gonna, get the white gouache with my rigger brush. 
So here's the rigger brush. And I'm going to spatter some sunshine <laughs> into my painting. Actually, I'll put the rigger brush down for a moment. I'll start the spattering with the six, number six round brush. And what I do is I simply, once you've got the top off the, off the paint tube of white, um, just push that, push that brush directly into the paint here. Uh, you might need to, I just use the masking tape edge of my, um, my painting here, just to roll that paint around into the fibers of the brush. Now I hold the brush back here and lightly hold it between thumb and middle finger. And that allows me to tap uh, that texture, that sort of white texture. I mean, this, this actually was an autumn scene. Um, Um, but it's what you want. But it, what it does for the painting is is fantastic. It just really uh, adds a sort of light to it. It's particles, air, airborne particle. Um, but more than that, it's a it's a it, it's good for the painting. It makes the painting look a little bit special, a little bit a little bit better. Uh, so there we are. And you you could this is one of those things you can almost not do too much of. And I say almost. Uh, my caveat, um, you can almost not do too much of, because what happens is 80%, uh, maybe thereabouts, of this white spatter will go into the paper in, in quite quickly in an hour. And uh, in an hour's time, you might only see some of it. You can always redo it if you really liked it and thought, well, do you know, it looked really good an hour ago before that paint disappeared. You can always redo that until you eventually you get it to exactly where you want it. So the final move here is for me to now to look at the rigger brush and uh, just say, you know, there, is there any area here perhaps that I could lift? Um, I don't think there's much call for this, but you know, on the odd, the odd little nick up there in the tree where there might be some dampness on that tree that's catching a bit of light. Uh, maybe a part of this wall is slightly more illuminated. But um, I would certainly give the lion's share of this, what I'm doing now, which is, which is just sort of subtle nuances uh, to the focal point territory. Uh, let's put a, let's suggest that one of those chimney pots is catching the light all right on top of that chimney stack. The actual chimney pots in the photo are sort of like a brick red color. I don't think that's, that would just get lost in, in that tonal value area. So I, I'm saying it's a, it might, it's local color might be red, but it's the light that, it's the color of the light that we, we can see. That's what, that's what you see on the top of that chimney stack. Um, so I think we're there folks. I'm gonna put the mount back around it. and um, weigh it up. And, and do remember that whatever you've got at the end of this session, um, you can either continue to work it tomorrow, and I often do, especially with mixed, medias, uh, mixed media paintings like this. Um, I often put them aside for uh, sometimes as much as two or three days, and um, I revisit them. And I'll, uh, what I can't see today, because it's all so fresh in my head, what I can't see today, I can often see two days later, or even just a day later, and I think, right, what that needs is this or that. But uh, let's put the mount back around it. And, you know, let, let's do the little tick box thing, the little, you know, list. Um, tonal values color temperatures, shapes, balance, design, composition, focal point, the seven things there. Um, certainly at the top of that list is tonal value, okay? Um, are the tones good? I think the tones lead us to the focal point simply because you, if you look at this foreground, how much brightness there is in the foreground and the gap, that all important gap here, okay, through that paler area here, takes us to the whitest of all the shapes and that's that one there. Now, the same could be done in reverse. If everything was really um, dark around here, sorry, if everything was very pale, sorry, and light, then you'd use dark tones to get you to a dark spot here. That's, that, that's 
just as effective it's your shout at the end of the day but what i'm looking for as i say is um the way we read it when we land when we imagine that we've just walked into a gallery and this is on the wall somewhere i always think try to think like that i think would this grab my attention um if it grabs my attention uh, it's probably first of all because of the tonal values in it and you wander over you take a closer look and then you're asking yourself you know what is it you like about it I, oh look you know i'm sort of i'm taking through this sort of journey of movement in a clockwise direction but you always sort of come down and come back up you you always end up on the focal point 